อ่าสูสูอ่าสูเซบาสเตียนเดียนสกีเอ็มฟรอมเอลยูเอลเอ็มยูมูนิชอ่าวิวิวอัลทอกอ่าเซบาสเตียนพิสอ่า thank you very much um thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to talk about my research here in the seminar and as my title already suggests we're we're talking today about uh, the influence of Q model models on the solution quality of quantum annealing and uh, this talk can be seen as a high level summary of my recent two research papers that one was published at uh, the gecko of, of this year and in the MDPI electronics journal also in this year So, if you like what you hear in this talk, you might be interested in reading further details in these papers. So, what are we talking about today? Um, the main point is here when we are trying to solve problems, we have different solvers and different algorithms and models at our hands to use to solve these problems. But really, as a computer scientist, we cannot influence the problem, right? So, somebody comes at us and, and wants to have the problem solved. So, we have to solve this exact problem. And on the other hand, I'm at least I'm not a physicist by training or an electrical electrical engineer, um, so I cannot design these these hardware systems, right? I do not build these hardware systems. So all we have as a computer scientist is we have some algorithms that we can try to tackle, improve, to solve our problems, and of course we have the mathematical models that help us to represent our problem in a better way, so that the algorithm can use certain properties even better. And in the case of quantum annealing, I would argue the algorithmic part is also at our disposal. So really, what we can influence to solve our problems is the mathematical model. So in this, in my in my um, recent research, and especially in this talk, I was interested in: Does it really matter when I'm solving a problem with quantum annealing which model I use? So the question is: If I have different models at my disposal. Does it matter, or do they all lead to equally good or bad solutions? And as we will see in this talk, for the problem I uh, took a closer look at, namely the th three satisfiability problem, it does make a difference, and we will we will see that. And after we established that uh, the choice of the model can significantly influence our solution quality we, we receive when using quantum annealing as a solving technique. Um, we are no longer happy with the current process of finding new Cuba models. So right now the process is we have a problem and then there's some expert that has years of training and uses a lot of time and a lot of their expertise to manually create new transformations from this problem to a mathematical model, in this case, Cubo. So this is no longer feasible as we have just established that the uh, choice of the Cubo model matters a lot. So we want to have a better process to find better Cubo models. And here comes an algorithmic method into place. So we want to solve it um, algorithmically. So we want to have problem and then an algorithm that gives us thousands or millions of new Cubo formulations automatically. So a lot, um, this is a lot uh, more scalable, but also we now have a, a significantly larger choice of model to choose from. So probably probably better cubo models will be within these uh, this set of uh, newly generated um, cubo models. And this is exactly what we will look in this presentation into greater detail. So we start off first by introducing the th three satisfiability problem. And this is quite easy. So we have here a formula in propositional logic where x1 through x4 are just Boolean variables, so either true or false, and we have some conjunctions and disjunctions and some negations. And our task really is to find a assignment of Boolean truth values to x1 through x4, such that this formula is satisfied. And for terminology, I mean, it's pretty obvious to see if we assign x2 the truth value true, this formula is satisfied. Okay, so um, these terms in these brackets are called clauses. So in this case, we have two clauses here. And of course, it's called three satisfiability. And hence, in each of these terms, so in each of these clauses, there are at most three variables. And it's also quite important because we will use it a lot. The number of the clauses is standardly um, denoted as M. 
So we have n is equals two here because we have two clauses and the number of variables is n. Important um, is that we are talking about different variables. So we have x1 through x4. Uh, the negation of x1 is of course not a new variable because we have x1 already. So we have n equals four variables here. So why are we talking about three set or why do I think three set is an interesting, interesting problem to study? It's because, or well, one of the reasons is at least the controllable hardness, right? So a lot of the time people study problems and we are not really certain, are they solving hard instance, instances or are they solving like really easy to solve problems? And I think, especially when we're talking about um, solving techniques like quantum annealing, where it's important um, to apply such techniques to hard problems, because easy problems can already be solved very well. Um, we need to be, be certain that we are dealing with hard problems. And this is quite easy to determine with, um, with set problems because it's determined more or less by a, by a ratio um, consisting of the clauses to variables. So if, if I have a certain amount of clauses and if I have a certain amount of variables, we can see in the lower picture. Uh, do you see my mouse, by the way? Probably yes. I hope so. So um, in, in the left-hand area here, we see um, it is, so the, the y-axis is time to solve. So we see in the left-hand area here, it's pretty easy to solve. We barely need any time to solve. Also in the right-hand area here, we also see it's very easy to solve. But only if the clauses to variables ratio reaches a certain um, ratio, problems get harder to solve. And we also see the same uh, at the uh, top graphic here. This is the probability that we find a solution. So on the left-hand side, the probability that we find a solution is 100%, basically. And on the right-hand side here, we see that the probability that we find a solution is basically zero. And this is just because there is no more solutions. So the problems are constructed in a way that there cannot possibly be a solution. But in the middle, there can be a solution, but to, finding, to find a solution gets significantly unlikely um, the more our... Uh, close to variable ratio um, goes to the right side. Okay, so we can control the hardness. So we can construct hard instances and we can try these hard instances in the context of quantum annealing. Okay, so uh, just a quick recap of the models we're dealing today with. Uh, this is a Cubo model. Cubo is basically um, a minimization problem or maximization problem, depending on uh, who you ask or what you formalize. But Nevertheless, uh, we have um, we have basically a matrix in the core of our problem, and we have um, a vector on the left hand side and, and the same vector on the right hand side. So once it's a column and once it's, it's uh, a row vector. And uh, the, the question is, please find a, a vector x such that this whole expression, this minimization problem here is minimized. And if we just apply matrix multiplication, we get this quadratic form here. This is a obviously a quadratic polynomial. But uh, in, in um, cubo form, the um, domain of the x values is 0 and 1. So we are talking about binary values here. And this has a um, peculiar uh, consequence, namely that these x1 squareds are actual, actually linear values because x1 squared, so xi squared is actually xi because we have to choose 0 and 1 for our x's. So 0 squared is 0. 1 squared is also 1, so um, x1 squared basically is x1 here. And same with the other values. Okay, so actually linear values are here on the main diagonal in this model. And uh, a very closely related model to the Cuba model is the Ising model. Um, the only difference between Cuba and Ising really is that we shifted the domain of the, um, of the values we can input. So in the Cuba model, we had 0 and 1 for our... Um, for our search variables uh, xi. Now we are shifting to minus one and one, and we call these variables no longer xi, but si now. And these are called spins. So, and because minus one squared is no longer minus one, but actually is one, we can no longer put the um, linear values on the diagonal. Hence, uh, you can see that there are just zeros on the diagonal but we introduced another vector that contains the linear values. And this vector is called just H. 
these models are isomorphic, so it doesn't really matter whether you use Ising or Cubo. You can just transform every Ising, Ising problem into a Cubo problem and uh, vice versa. Okay, so these are the, the models um, we are talking today about. Uh, I just told that. And right now I want to introduce some basic transformations from the three, three set problem uh, to Cubo so we can understand what we are doing later in this talk. The first one is pretty easy. It's a transformation by Vicky Choi. And um, suppose we are given this for formula in three set uh, form. What we are doing is we are constructing a graph problem out of it. So we are reducing this three set problem to a maximum independent set problem. And to do so, uh, we first start off by introducing nodes for all of our literals. So you see, there's an X1, there's a node called X1, and likewise, here's minus X1, and there's a node minus X1. So for each literal and all of our clauses, we introduce nodes. And then we interconnect just every node inside of a clause with each other. So we construct, we construct a constraint triangle, if you will. And um, after that, all that is left to do is really if there is a variable in one clause and the negation, that's important, just the negation, the negation of a of the same variable in another clause, we interconnect these by another edge. And this is all we have to do. Now we have constructed a cubo transformation from three set um, yeah, to cubo. And because of the way we are constructing it, so for each literal, we are constructing a new node, and this is, of course, an entry in our uh, cube formulation at the end. There are m clauses, and consequently, there are three m variables needed to, to represent this problem as a cube problem. And thus, this will result in a cube of size 3m times 3m. So far, so good. Now, there comes a quite, well, at least significantly harder to understand transformation, and I purposefully chose to uh, to live through the pain with you. I did not try to, to improve this didactically because later on, we will introduce an automatic algorithmic procedure that is able to generate this transformation automatically. So if you're struggling now, you, you're uh, even more appreciating the algorithmic procedure we invented later on. Okay, so what, what is this about? So the idea of Chancellor, in his transformation is, first of all, we have these clauses. And these clauses are, first of all, atomic units, basically. There is no interconnection to any other of these clauses. They stand for themselves. So what if we just transform each of these clauses into a separate Kubo representing the energy spectrum of these clauses? And then we combine all of these, um, all of these polynomials or all of these Kubos into a single Kubo or a single big polynomial representing our uh, the, the energy spectrum of the whole three set formula. And this is done as follows. So first of all, we transform a clause. So, and, and the idea is we can represent the truth value of a clause just as a sum of Boolean values. So if I put in, for example, x1 true, uh, x2 true and x3 true, we can also put in basically ones for true and zeros for false on the right-hand side here. And whenever this is satisfied, the left-hand side of this clause is satisfied, the right-hand side will always, and only then, will always lead to the value one. If the left-hand side is not satisfied, the, the right-hand side will always, and only then, uh, lead to the value zero. So this is basically really equal. Uh, we have a clause here and a Boolean sum over here. Now, Chancellor proceeds to, to just substitute all these x's through s's. So we're transforming from binary vari 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 variables to spin variables. And uh, this is currently an optimization problem because satisfaction means one, not satisfaction means zero. Now we just transform it to a minimization problem by just introducing a minus before. And if you put in the uh, transformation, as well as uh, negation here to make it a minimization problem, you get this term. You don't need to understand it really right now. Um, this is just, just uh, substitution. So what we do next, we look at this term and we find a constant at the end. In case of optimization, we don't care about constants, so we just drop it. 
And now what we see is, first of all, all the blue values are either um, linear. So you just see one as one here. There's a one as two and there's a S for three or quadratic. Yeah, so S1, S2, S1, S3, S2, S3. So this is no problem. We can uh, represent this natively in a Ising or Cuba problem. And this is straightforward by just taking the coefficients. But there's a problem. We have a cubic term here. And there's S1, S2, S3. And this cannot be done in Ising or Cubo natively. So we need to come up with a solution. And this is the contribution of Chancellor in this particular transformation. He uh, introduced a way of representing this cubic term in a quadratic model. So first of all, what we um, what we may observe is that this term is actually a parity check. So if we put in a uh, an odd number of minus ones, so remember S1 can be either minus one or one. So if you put an, an odd number of minus ones in here in these three variables, you get uh, the result one eighth, one over eight. And if you put an even number of minus ones in there, you get the results of minus one over eight. So actually, and this is a parity check. And um, you can represent a parity check in uh, Ising by using these values. So you, you do not have, understand where they come from. It's just, this is the contribution of Chancellor. He, he found out you can do a parity check in an Ising model like this. And what's really important here is that you see S1 is here, S2 is here, and S3 is also there, but there's an A. Yeah, so the, this a does not appear somewhere here in in our in our um, in our term. So really, this is an additional um, variable that helps us to model the spectrum. We cannot do it without an additional variable. We have to introduce an additional variable here. Yeah, and now we can just put it all together. We have the easing model for the quadratic and linear terms. We have the easing model for the cubic term, and of course, we can just put this together and have an easing model representing a whole model. Uh, a whole a whole set clause. This is important for, for the whole clause. Okay, so um, we put it back to Cubo. This arrow should uh, just resemble the transformation from Ising back to Cubo and receive this. Okay, so now we have learned how we can transform a single set clause into a Cubo. And now what we need to do is we, we just repeat this process for all of the clauses, and then we need to combine them. And just for an example here, we just combine the cube to uh, cubo models for the first clause and the second clause. And this is also straightforward because we're, we're actually dealing with, with polynomials, if you wish. This is quite easy because there is a minus two and then there's an x1 squared. And also in the upper right-hand side, there's a minus one and an x1 squared. So of course, we can just add them together. And this is, um, this is signified by the different colors here. So I coded the ones in the upper left-hand side blue. I coded the ones in the upper right-hand side black, so it is quite easy to understand where these values are coming from. And as these are just polynomials, we just add them together and uh, get a new cubo representing these two clauses um, as a whole. And if we, of course, repeat this process for all of the clauses, we get a cubo representing our whole problem. And now the interesting thing here is it's we are talking about the size. The size of this cubo is First of all, n. n stands for the amount of variables we have. This is quite obvious. But also there's this plus m. And as we have just seen, remember um, in this term, we have to add, so to represent the cubic term, we have to add an additional variable. And we have to do this for each and every clause. So this is where the plus m comes from because we have to introduce an additional variable in each clause and we have m clauses. So, and last but not least, there's another transformation. The transformation a colleague of mine and I together invented and published on the ICCS of this year in Amsterdam. Here, the idea is basically the same as Chancellor. So we construct a cubo by, first of all, transforming all the clauses into small cubos and then combining these small cubos into a big cubo. But the rule changes. So we are no longer dealing with parity checks or with some, some logic and transformation. But really, we just came up with, so we thought about it a lot. And we came up with these, one can say, pattern. Yeah, And actually, it's not really important that you understand right now how this is exactly working. But just, just um, keep in mind that there is a way of using patterns 
to uh, construct new transformation. And this is what we will um, dive into uh, a lot of uh, more depth later on in this talk, because this is the integral part, because out of this idea, we constructed our algorithmic method um, for finding cubo formulations automatically. Okay, so now you, you should have a basic understanding of these cubo transformations we're dealing with. So the important is one is 3m and the other ones are 2n plus m. And um, yeah, so now we are trying to look at the differences that occur when solving problems on a quantum leading platform using these different models. So what did we do? We actually just made a very small um, setup, but it's enough to, to see all the interesting things we wanted to see. So first of all, we have a... We have a transformation, the Choi one, that is sized 3M, meaning the cubo is the biggest of all of the cubos we're looking at. And then we have two, uh, three cubos of the same size. So Chancellor J1, Chancellor J5, and the one Venice line. Uh, the Chancellor J1 and Chancellor J5 um, um, transformations just differ by a free parameter. So Chancellor actually has a free parameter, and this is the free parameter is called J. And when we when we set J to one, we call this transformation J1 and the other one is J5. Okay, so here it's important. All of these N plus M sized cubos are obviously of the same size, but they are of different structure, meaning they are, they are differently, there's a different number of quadratic and linear values within the cubos. The values are in, in at, at different places. So these, although they have the same size, they are not the same matrices at the end. And this is important. So what did we do? Um, we generated a thousand three set formulas within the critical area. This is the basically the hardness area. So these are potentially hard areas. Although of, of course we can have a discussion about how hard can problems really be that have eleven variables. Yeah, but nevertheless, it's it's just a fair amount for for a quantum annealing system. And then we use we transform all of these th thousand problems. Um, into cubos using all of these transformations, all of these four transformations. And then we solve each of the cubos that we receive here 1,000 times, meaning we get 1 million DBF samples per cubo transformation. Okay, and let's take a look at the results. And what we see here is significant, significant differences. Uh, first of all, in the number of solved formulas, we see at the top Chancellor J1, um, out of 1,000 formulas, 910 were solved. Chancellor J5, um, only 58% were solved, 580. And also in the, in the Department of Total Correct Answers, we see uh, that Chancellor J1 leads to 87,000 out of a million, which is 8.7%. And Chancellor J5 at the bottom leads to 4,700, 4, or 4,800 4, rather, which is... 0.48 percent. So it's a it's a whole order of magnitude difference. And what's even more interesting is that um, the size does not seem that important. So joy is a three m uh, is a three m transformation, meaning this is the bigger matrix. Joy is the bigger cubo matrix, while Chancellor J five is the smaller cubo matrix. And we often hear in um, we often hear that uh, in the NISC era, so in the noisy intermediate square quantum, we have a lot of noise. And of course, the smaller or the sparser the matrices are, the better, because we need less um, qubits. And less qubits means less probability of errors occurring. But this seems not to be that easy, basically. So we see here that even um, although this is significantly bigger, um, the results are significantly worse, both in the apartment of soft formulas as well as in the number of total correct answers. So this is not that trivial. So just size is not a good indicator of how good a transformation is. And also we see amongst the transformations of the same size, these are all, so Chancellor J1, Nussline, and Chancellor J5 are all N plus M size. These are all the same sizes of the cubo matrix. But again, the, the difference in the um, number of total correct answers is, is, a, is a whole order of magnitude. So also we can just cannot say, okay, we have a transformation that gives us a small cubo. It must be good. Um, so we have to check it. We have to really check it. So first of all, let's see why this may or may not be occurring. What we can see here is how many physical qubits were actually used on the D-Wave system to solve these problems. 
And what we can see, of course, Jensel J1, Jensel J5, and Nussline, as they are all n plus m transformations, so in theory, they should all be equally, they should all need equally amounts of um, physical qubits on the D-Wave system. We just experimentally verified this, and this is indeed true. They all need exactly the same amount of physical qubits on the D-Wave system. And Joy is a uh, 3M, so it's a lot bigger than all of these. Um, transformation and also it needs a lot more physical qubits. So we have experimentally verified and checked that this is the case. So we need a lot more qubits, but still Joy performs better than Gen J5. So it just cannot be that the size is all it, all that matters. Next, um, what we did here, we check the densities of the cubos and we see, yeah, there are some differences. So as, as uh, mentioned beforehand, um, these are not the same Q matrices. There are some differences. And, and density here really is a, a um, is a measure for how many values are to be found within the upper triangular Q matrix. So is it full? Then the density is one. So a completely filled upper triangular matrix um, has a density of one. And a completely empty upper triangular matrix has a density of zero. And everything in between is here. So we can see the upper triangular matrix in all of these cases is approximately between, what is it, like 9, 10, 10 to 12% or something. Okay, but nevertheless, we see they are different. So what, what could be possible explanations for this? We, we tried to look at it, and to this day, we, we just gained a lot of new insight, but, but at the time of, of writing this paper, this was uh, the motivation for, for looking at it uh, specifically. Um, D-Wave does scaling. So whenever we solve a problem on a D-Wave system, all the quadratic values, meaning all the values not on the main, main diagonal in a cubic problem, are scaled to the range minus one and one. And all the linear values, meaning all the values on the main diagonal, are scaled to the range minus four and four. So what happens if we have a huge range of values, meaning one of the cubic values is zero and another one is 10,000? We have to scale it to the same range. So it's scaled to zero and one. But what happens if, if we have like values that are really, 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 really close together, like for example, eight and 16, these also get very close together. And now I want to ask the question in a system where we have heavy noise, no error correction, can you really resemble or can you really tell these values apart for the whole process of annealing? I would doubt that. Um, that's why we took a closer look at some of these metrics. Namely, we wanted to see First of all, how many different quadratic values are there in our cubos that we create? So, and by the number of different quadratic values, I mean, we are looking really at the upper triangular matrix without the main diagonal. So we do not care about the main diagonal, just the upper triangular matrix. And we count how many different values we have. In this example, there's a zero or two zeros, but there's a zero value and there's a one value. So we have two different values, namely zero and one. And also we take a look at the size of the value ranges. So we are interested um, again in the quadratic values. So we are only looking at the reds, red values here in the, at the bottom. And what is the size of the value range? The lowest value is zero, the highest value is one. So the value range is from zero to one, basically the, the interval if you wish. And the same, we did the same for the linear values. So we just looked at the main diagonal and, and also concluded the lowest value is minus one, the biggest value is zero. So the size of the value range here is zero because this determines how much the cubes get stretched and how many intervals we have to um, have to build within these um, smaller value ranges. Okay, so, and now when evaluating these things, we see first of all, which country I'm from, but second of all, we see um, a nice correlation. I mean, when, when we talk about the number of quadratic values, we see that um, all the good transformations, so Chancellor J1 had the best results, solved the most formulas, had the most correct answers, has the least number of different quadratic values. The same as Nussline, it has the second most solved formulas and the second um, most uh, total correct answers. And it also has the second um, least or most, if you will, number of different quadratic values. And Jensen J5, again, the worst, um, or the least amount of solved formulas, the least amount of total correct answers, but the most number of different quadratic values. So this is an interesting correlation we found here. And then we looked at the size of the value ranges. Again, remember the, the, the example where we had like a zero value and a 10,000 value, and we have to 
to squeeze it down into the um, array of zero and one. Um, what we are looking here, so it is not important what these values actually represent. This is a, so what you see here is a box plot of the, so this is representing the distribution over all of the 1000 formulas. Um, so what, what's really necessary is to understand the relative position of these, of these graphs. So it's not about the height of the interval, but it's rather the relative position. What's important here is that the green box plot for Chancellor J1, which represents the size of the quadratic values, um, is rather very slow. This is a logarithmic, logarithmic scale. So we're talking about, what is this, like max five or six or something. So the lowest and the biggest value are like five integers apart. Then we see also Chancellor <clears throat> J1 has the best results, the lowest spread. Uh, the Nussline transformation has the second lowest spread and uh, the second best results. And what we see here by the relative position of the green box plot, uh, that the Chancellor J5 transformation had the least or uh, the worst results and also the biggest spread. And this is more or less what we expected. We could not see the same correlation with the linear values, as you can see here. For, for example, Chancellor J1 had the best results, but I would argue that um, the spread, again, the relative position of this blue box plot here is a bit higher than this box plot here. So there's not that clear cut of a correlation here. But again, the linear values of the Chancellor J5 um, transformation, again, the worst results, the highest bit. So there may or may not be a somewhat uh, correlation in the linear values, but the quadratic values is quite clear here. So um, what we did, we just modified our transformation here and tried to verify this. We take a, we take a, transformation that is already working very well, namely the gentle J1 transformation. And we scale each of these cubes by different amount of um, different amounts of um, yeah, factors, if you will. What we do is we do not change the optimal value. The optimal value is still the same. So an optimal solution will have the minimum energy, but um, we scale the energy landscape. And this leads to a higher number of uh, quadratic and linear couplers. So again, we just run this experiment and just by scaling, again, just by scaling, we just multiplied all of these clauses by different values, not changing the objective, but changing rather how many um, linear and quadratic values we find within them. We, um, we basically double checked our hypothesis that, that the different number of quadratic values can have an impact or should be considered when um, evaluating that's this, these kinds of um, transformations. And we see that um, we now gain a lot of less solved formulas, like 12% or so, 11%. But also we drop like 60,000 correct answers by just uh, doing the scaling. So this is, was just a double check for, for from our side to, to see um, if this is really a correct hypothesis. So what can we conclude in this paper? We can conclude that the model matters. You can see here, this is quite a significant um, quite a significant difference. And we need to, to be careful um, which model we choose. And also we have seen that the number of the different quadratic values and the size of the value range of the quadratic values seems to impact the solution quality. Okay, so this is the first part. Now that we've understood that the, the choice of the Cubo model might matter, we are now no longer happy with uh, how we create um, these cubos, the cubo transformation. And I think this is quite well visualized by this picture when we try to manually search cubo transformations from three set problems to cubos, we are quite limited by time, for example, or there are not that many experts that deal with these problems. Uh, Sebastian? Yes. Can I interrupt? So sure. we, this is a 30-minute seminar, so if oh. you may already... I was told I have 45 <laughs> no, <not>. minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, that's unfortunate. Ah, uh, so it it do you okay, but uh, you can present uh, a little bit quickly <laughs> if possible. Okay, okay, very quickly. Sorry, I, I thought it was a forty-five minute seminar. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, algorithmic method. The idea is uh, again we can superimpose. So we build. Or what, what's the beauty of three set is we can um, superimpose, so we can build a cube per each of these clauses, and this can uh, we can skip these. This is not really important. What's important is 
Um, when we try to automate this process, we need a clause and all of these satisfying assignments need to have the same energy and the non-satisfying assignment has a high has to have a higher energy. So this is all we have to do. And for that, we can take a blueprint of a cubo, namely here a cubo where we have Q1 through Q, Q10, not real values, but just variables. And then what we do is we brute force. So we brute force values from a value range, namely here minus one through um, zero and one, fill in these values, try all combinations, and then we get a pattern cubo for a clause. And as soon as we have a correct clause cubo, mainly all satisfying assignments need to have the minimum energy and the non-satisfying assignment has to have a higher energy. We have found a cubo that we can use um, in this manner. So this is a correct cubo now for this clause. And we repeat this process for all of these. And then we get different cubo transformations. And by doing this process, um, only for this value range, we get 2,000 different set cubo transformations. And by using this value range, minus, minus 2, 0, and 2, we get millions of set cubos. OK, so and uh, let me conclude really quick. We did a another um, another set of tests. And we found that within our just randomly chosen out of these millions of new cubos, just we just took one, and it proved to to um, yeah be better, at least like five percent or so in the number of total correct answers than the chance J one that formally produced the best results. Okay, um, yeah. One final note, if I may, um, why is this automatic generation of of cubos so important? Because it uh, now you do not have to understand the transformations into greater depth, but you just can generate millions of millions of transformations yourself automatically. So a non-expert in these fields can now use these automatic methods to generate new transformations and use quantum technologies without having to be an expert in, in transformations or uh, something else. Yeah. Okay. Ran through there quite quickly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well Okay, so now it's time for question. So I, I will start first. So I'm wondering uh, that this <clears throat> feature comes from the nature of the problem or nature from the uh, solving the problem by quantum information. Uh, if the answer is, uh, if it's from the quantum, so do you try to test with uh, simulated annealing? Yes, yes, of course. So we tested with uh, simulated annealing and we also tested with digital annealing, so the technology by Fujitsu. And we found that there are differences no matter which technology you choose. So you can, um, I actually, linked my GitHub here. So there is a library that uh, implemented the automatic algorithm. So you will find basically millions of cubos you can just use and a set of uh, set examples. And you can verify yourself that um, um, when you use different cubo models, you will also get significantly different results in the department of, um, of correct answers and soft formulas uh, in simulated alleling, in taboo search, in... Um, uh, in digital anything. But one, one disclaimer, I have to add one disclaimer. So if you're going to test this yourself, uh, you have to make sure that the formulas are big enough because we have error correction in, in classical systems and classical systems are quite powerful. Make sure the SAT formulas are at least like 500 clauses or so. And then you start to see differences within simulated anything as well. Uh, so, so, so your conclusion is it, it, so, you see the difference between the quantum annealer and the or uh, you, you don't try yet? Um, so, so did I understand your question right? So you asked me if I see the differences within, so between quantum annealing and simulated annealing? Yes. Um, so again, from a model perspective, um, the, the model matters, of course, but from a solution qu quality perspective, um, classical systems are quite powerful at the moment, at, at the at the current time, and 
Yeah, because of error correction, uh, because of all of so this. My, 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 mm -hmm. my question is, so you see the difference between the models using quantum annular. So do you, do you see that the same difference when you use simulated annealing? Ah, you mean, so, okay, 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 I see. Um, uh, actually not, so it depends on, on what the question actually means. So first of all, um, this not the same models are performing the best than on quantum annealing. So there are models that perform really, really good on quantum annealing, um, but worse in simulated annealing. And there are models that perform really, really, really well in simulated annealing. Um, and these are not the same models. Okay, so good performers in quantum annealing does not mean good performer in simulated annealing. You have to check that. But also in simulated annealing, there are different differences between models. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Arjendra, would you ask? Uh, Vivi, I think you raised your hand first. Um, um, I'm sorry for that. Okay. Um, thank you for a nice talk, Sebastian. Um, your automatic method for generating uh, good cubos, how so how specific is is it to a the problem and b the hardware? So uh, it feels like it's low level compiling down to the hardware, um, which of course you expect to make a difference if you are optimizing it for the range of of variables available in the, in the hardware. But of course, this could be very different in different hardware. So, um, but in particular, you've shown how it works for 3SAT and I'm interested for how different it would be for say max 2SAT or um, some other what, sort of, so still something that easily forms a cubo, but it's a, a different problem structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um... The method is, I'd say, rather simple, first of all. It's exhaustive search, so scaling is a problem in the first place. But, um, of course, uh, it is not really hardware um, hardware dependent in, in that way that we've specifically created this to, to produce good uh, cubo formulations for, for D-Wave specifically. Mm -hmm. um, this is an exhaustive search, meaning we um, create all possible combinations and there are really good performers but also really really bad performers mm -hmm. so this is not specific at all we just happened to pick a good transformation at random we could have also just and to, to be fair we, we we picked a lot of these um, beforehand and, and there were also some bads amongst them okay so this is not specific at all um um as to how this uh, transforms or how this is apl applicable to other problems the beauty of the sub problem really is, um, I mean, is this here. So we have these really, really small um, independent components, namely these clauses. Mm -hmm. So whenever you have a really, really small independent um, sub problem within within your problem, you can apply this method without any modification whatsoever. But as soon as you have like, so the hardest problems for, for, for this method, for example, would be one hot encode problems, like for example, TSP. If you use a TSP problem and try to solve it with this method, I'm pretty sure you will have no luck because the scaling is so bad. And yeah, so, so generally anything that's one hot encoded is, is not working, but I'm, I would be fairly confident that you might find certain graph problems like maximum independent set or graph coloring or something that may actually be um this method might actually be be useful for i'm not certain yet but i'm certain one hot encoded problems is not gonna cut it okay great thank you very much thank you um um sebastian um thank you very much for for the talk it was very very clear and i liked the slide 50 with the germany flag um, uh, um I, I had the same question as Vivi, whether the, does the problem matters? Um, you answered that. And the second question is, since you generate so many versions of the Cuba problem, I wonder how many minutes or seconds or hours of D-Wave processing you had to use for those? Okay, so the um, 
So are we talking about um, this particular uh, table where we generated the results for the yes. for the experiment? Um, this should be around two and a half hours of D-Wave QPU time, more or less. I'm not exactly sure, but around two hours of QPU time. For, for all of them, for the whole table? Yes, for the whole table, okay. including... so including the time we needed to make sure that the code is working. We ran some preliminary experiments and some, some setup testing. So all of this together, including this table, is around two and a half hours of pure D-Wave QPU time. I see. Thank you. And, and the other question is, is just curiosity. In slide number 16, you showed a way of calculating the hardness of mm -hmm. this problem. Yes. Um, is this a specific... Um, technique you have for different problems in particular we are interested in in a variant of a graph coloring problem is mm -hmm. there something like that for that problem um, that's a good question that? so in in general what what we do in in set is um we have really strong set solvers and what we do is we generate so first of all this this phase transition so this blue area is called a phase mm -hmm. transition area and this phase transition area uh, can be experimentally verified by you by by generating random uniform three set problems and then using a set solver to solve these problems. And all you see here is that, hence here's the time, we just put it into a, a set solver and uh, see how long it takes. So, so this I is see. our our solving, or this is basically the idea how this graphics um, is created. And this is quite, quite impressive um, if you just generate set firmness of, of like a thousand clauses, which is not very much, you can get weeks of calculation time. So yeah, this is the whole trick. So in, in your area, in, in graph coloring, you might just um, take a look at an established solver in that area and just figure out how long the program is running for a certain parameterization of your problem. Um, and then you may find these areas as well. But also, I, I might imagine that um, graph coloring may have, because graph coloring is quite a well-studied problem, I think if you're looking for phase transition and graph coloring problems, you might get an idea where this area may be. Right. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions? OK. Thank you, Sebastian, again. And uh, I think it's all set. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you Have very a good much. Day. Thank you.